Welcome. I'm, I'm morning, everybody, and uh, afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Happy to have you here. My name is uh, Judy Moore. I am uh, the Senior Policy Fellow at the Center for Global Development. It's a Washington, D.C. and London-based think tank. Really thrilled that you could join us uh, for this session uh, in the, the 2021 Global Health Summit regional uh, meetings here in Kampala. This is the first time it's ever been in Africa. It's unfortunate that we can't all be together in the same place, but it's also fortunate that you know, people from different places can participate as probably would not have happened if we could meet in person. The session is generously uh, sponsored by Viatris um, and will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on NCDs, non-communicable diseases. Now, obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic and, and all of our attention is focused on putting out this fire. And because of that, regardless of where we are, our, the attention is almost overwhelmingly focused on the pandemic. However, we know that as we focus on the pandemic, it's allowed, it's taken away resources from NCDs. And from anything that we've seen, according to the WHO, seven out of 10 deaths annually are, are caused by NCDs. And for those who've been most affected by the pandemic are people with comorbidities, mainly NCDs. And so for us today, this panel is going to talk about how these two are related and how our response to NCDs actually helps us strengthen our health systems. And, and we have an incredible panel for you today. And to begin with, our first, um, our first speaker is um, uh, Menasi Tedesi. Menasi is um, he's currently head of the, the emerging market practice at uh, uh, Viatris, it's a healthcare company created by a merger between Myelin and Upjohn, which is a division, used to be a division of, of Pfizer. He is uh, responsible over, to oversee about 125 markets, over 200 brands, and leads a team of over 3,500 people. He brings about two decades, maybe more, uh, of experience to this field, and it's my, my great pleasure, Minasi, to turn over the screen to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jude for that kind uh, introduction. Uh, thank you for helping to moderate the session uh, today. I, I first wanna extend my congratulations to the organizers of the World Health Summit uh, for hosting this regional meeting, as you said, albeit uh, remote, uh, but for the first time in, in Africa. In, in doing so, this meeting has now been held in at least, in every continent, at least once, uh, which is a, a remarkable uh, achievement to speak of. Hosting this regional meeting here also means that this year, we get a particular focus, as you were pointing out, uh, to Africa's special and very specific healthcare needs. And when it comes to a particular topic of non-communicable diseases in Africa, during and beyond this COVID-19 pandemic, this discussion could not have come uh, a moment too soon. As a global healthcare network, uh, as uh, we see progress at different stages uh, of being able to, to come back from this pandemic, uh, to be able to really put it behind us uh, to the extent possible. We have plenty to reflect on, on the lessons that have been learned and the insights that have been gained over the last year and a half. A glaring fact, uh, Jude, as you pointed out, that stands out amongst the rest of them uh, is that despite uh, the global trend of diverting resources away from uh, non-communicable diseases to the care of, uh, of uh, being able to mitigate the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, putting out the fire, NCD mortality is the primary driver of COVID-19 related fatalities. Uh, these NCDs like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, a chronic respiratory disease, cancers, uh, and, a, and a number of others were estimated to have contributed anywhere from 60 to 90% of COVID-19 related deaths. Uh, as for survivors, various studies have found that coronavirus has exasperated the progression of their pre-existing NCDs and in some cases, even cause new complex NCDs in previously healthy COVID patients around the world. As such, it cannot be underestimated uh, to say that the growing prevalence of NCDs in Africa has exponentially increased the morbidity uh, rate of COVID-19 in the continent. Right before uh, the pandemic, uh, a Lancet Journal article marked a surge in the burden of NCDs on Sub-Saharan Africa over the past two decades driven by increasing incidence of cardiovascular disease factors such as unhealthy diets, reduced physical activity, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, air pollution, and a number of other factors. At a rate of Africa's NCD burden was growing, it was going to overtake communicable 
maternal, neonatal, and nutritional diseases combined. Again, that, that's important to, to emphasize, so I'll say it again. At the rate that the NCD burden was growing, it was on the path to being able to overtake communicable, maternal, neonatal, and nutritional diseases combined as the leading cause of mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa by 2030. Just a year later, the World Health Organization's preliminary analysis of 14 countries in the African region named hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and asthma as the comorbidities most associated with COVID-19 uh, patients. So uh, across a public and private sector, it's important that we continue to work together to be able to address this urgent health need, forming private and public partnerships to be able to bring much needed NCD healthcare to vulnerable communities across the continent and for that matter beyond. Only through establishing strong partnerships with local governments, health institutions, NGOs, broader stakeholders, will we be able to play an effective role in improving every NCD patient's journey and their treatment pathways in the near and the longer term. This has always been the mission for me and my colleagues at Beatrice by helping individuals to be able to live healthier and happier. We also hope to be able to help nations grow and prosper. As one of the leading pharmaceutical companies to which emerging market citizens look to key NCD medications, we take this role in the global fight of NCDs very seriously. And we actively seek to collaborate with partners, NGOs, policymakers, local health officials to be able to provide sustained and widespread access to effective treatments uh, to help prevent NCDs. In fact, we recently signed a, a memorandum of understanding with the United Nations Institute of Training and Research for the Defeat NCD uh, Partnership, an agreement that ensures our commitment to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goal of reducing NCD mortality by a third by 2030 through enabling all low resource countries to be able to scale up in their fight against NCDs. Partnerships like these are what will enable tangible and effective solutions to Africa's NCD crisis at hand. We hope to encourage other healthcare professionals, partners, NGOs, governments to be able to establish their own collaborations. And in doing so, uh, they can strengthen Africa's healthcare, uh, healthcare systems for tackling NCDs through this uh, pandemic and, and beyond it. More than a year into the pandemic, we have clearly learned that health security is a matter of national and economic importance, and that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. So as a whole, the global community has spent trillions of dollars on COVID-19 response so far. And ironically, the world would have reached its uh, UN Sustainable Development Goal to be able to reduce NCD mortality by a third with the money that we spent on COVID-19 in just over six months, right? That being said, the goal is within reach. So long as, as we're able to work together, we're able to create these partnerships through sustained commitment, innovation, and, and action across the board from healthcare uh, leaders, policymakers, there's an ability to be able to help us to push forward together, to be able to reduce significantly the burden of NCDs in Africa and, and beyond. I look forward uh, to this discussion today and ongoing collaboration as we go forth. Thank you very much, uh, Jude, and, and thank you for all the uh, panelists as well. Back to you, Jude. And I see, thank you. And it's, it's really, really frightening just listening to the statistics because um, it means that it's possible that if those numbers were to get to that point, we would have an ending pandemic in, in NCDs, I mean, in terms of the death toll. And so as we attempt to get better health outcomes for um, patients across the continent, it is my pleasure today to, I mean, one of the things that you, you highlighted is that this is gonna be a collaborative. We, we have the private sector, we have the nonprofit sector, we have the government sector, and it's all, all of us working together that actually helps to deliver the kinds of health outcomes that we want, which is why we have such an exceptional panel today, because uh, I think we couldn't have put together a better panel to discuss these issues. And so <clears throat> I want to encourage everybody who's attending this, you can, you can submit your questions to us through the chat function, and we'll do everything we can to get to as many questions as possible. But first, I, I'm gonna um, just introduce the panel and then they're just gonna speak in the order in which I'm introducing them. So first is Dr. Svetlana Axelrod. She's the director of WHO's Global NCDs platform. 
she leads uh, the, the response and the, the WHO action and fight against NCDs. She served as WHO Assistant Director General for NCDs and Mental Health. And, and we're really, really pleased to have her with us today. Um, the next person joining us will be Dr. Leal Bajud. She's technical specialist and, and special assistant to the CEO of Defeat NC, NCD Partnership at the UN Institute for Training and Research. She too brings a great wealth of, of experience and, and, and training to today's and previously she served our health assistant manager at the International Committee for the Red Cross in Syria. So we're pleased to have her. Then I'm pleased to introduce uh, Shakta Pakka, Regional Chief Medical Officer for Emerging Markets and Head of Global NCD Excellent Teams at Viatris. And, uh, and of course, uh, we're also pleased to be joined by Dr. Dr. Ratna Devi. She's CEO and, CEO and co-founder of, I hope I'm saying this right, Dakshama um, Emerging Markets and she's and, and head of, uh, of Dakshama Health and Education, an organization that is dedicated to working to advance access to health, patient education and advocacy. She's also served as the board chair of the International Alliance of Patients Organizations. We're pleased to have her. But last and not least, I'm just trying to get through them quickly so that we can hear from them because that's why we're here. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Feng Zhao, the practice manager for health, nutrition, population and global practice at the World Bank. Dr. Zhao too has spent 20 plus years working in public health issues, especially in African markets. Really, really pleased to have this excellent panel. And I will turn over now to Dr. Svetlana Axelrod. Thank you very much, uh, Judy, and the greetings from Geneva. Uh, thank you for getting this uh, meeting. And I think it's very important that WHO will be presented during the World Health Summit in the regional meeting. And it's a great opportunity for me to speak on behalf of the WHO about the work that we are going on on the NCDs. As you already said at the beginning and the quick introduction from myself, yes, I was uh, with the WHO for the couple of years and it's a really great opportunity for me to now to just brief you and to share a couple of slides what we are going on on the NCDs. So as you already, I already said I am a Dr. Svetlana Axelrod, I'm Russian and uh, I'm working for the WHO and I'm a director of the Global NCD platform. It is a department which is placed in the office of the dire uh, Deputy Director General. But let me start uh, sharing my presentation with you. I hope that you can see it now. Can you see it? Great, thanks. So, um, uh, and uh, the department that I'm leading on is the global NCD platform is a new uh, department which was established after the transformation which was in the uh, WHO and we are uh, leading by the Deputy Director General, Dr. Susanna Jacob. The department uh, brings uh, together two secretariats. One is the Secretariat of the Global Coordination Mechanism and the last uh, WHO Assembly and the member states extended uh, this uh, um, secretariat, this work of the Global Coordination Mechanism till the 2030. It's a great, really, achievement and it shows that we have a lot of things to do in the future. So the Global Coordination Mechanism is uh, consisting of over than uh, 250 participants, including the member states, UN agencies, funds, programs, and non-state actors. And also in my department, I also have uh, the Secretariat of the UN Interagency Task Force, which is uh, covering the work of the more than 40 UN agencies and World Bank and other regional development banks. So this is the department that is working with different stakeholders uh, and uh, non-state actors to bring the NCD agenda on the high level to achieve this sustainable development goal 3.4 on reducing the burden of the NCDs and um, mental health. 
And we are working through the three levels of the organization, regional, headquarters, and also uh, national levels. So uh, I would like maybe to start my the presentation showing the global perspective on the uh, interplay of COVID and LCDs. And the negative impact of the pandemic uh, on the delivery of needs, health services to patients with these uh, comorbidities. Com uh, then I would like to uh, outline the challenges uh, the COVID has brought about into the WHO African region through the lens of NCD prevention and control. I believe the reason all of us join today this panel and discussion is because that all of us agree that people with pre-existing NCDs appear to be more vulnerable to be becoming severely ill with COVID and to have unfordable outcomes as a result of these comorbidities. So uh, the most important is people who are uh, living with this disease, they have different metabolic risks. And I would like to see and to show it on this slide that this is hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, cardiovascular diseases. And you know it very well that it is people with a risk of a heart attack, with a stroke. Also, these people are suffering from the chronic respiratory diseases, and also some of them are suffering from the cancer. And uh, on this slide, I would like also to pay your attention on a couple of examples that happened uh, during the pandemic in some of the countries. And as you can see, uh, in Italy, for example, uh, people are died from COVID in the hospitals, have uh, the pre-existing conditions such as the hypertension and, hyperti and uh, uh, diabetes. Also in Spain, you can see on this slide, uh, the patients who were hospitalized due to the COVID were discovered to be chronic cardiovascular diseases, which made their conditions worse. And also there is an example from China. Unfortunately, this is a very, very bad data that we have, but we should focus on this, that NCDs should be on focus during the pandemic. On this slide, I would like to say that uh, WHO uh, last year in May 2020 uh, made a quick rapid assessment uh, detailing the initial impact of the COVID pandemic on NCDs resources and service. And it is important to know that three quarters, and it is 75% of countries reported that there was some disruption to one or more NCD related services. As you can see from this slide, globally, the rehabilitation service were the most likely to be impacted. With and a half of the countries reporting and the particular disruption and an additional 20% reporting complete disruption. And the rehabilitation services were particularly impacted in the African region. Uh, for the Europe, it was the 71% and 79% of the countries reporting disruption in each region respectively. This study also accessed disruption to such services as hypertension management, diabetes, and diabetic complications management, asthma services, palliative care services, also de uh, dental care, uh, cancer treatment, and cardiovascular emergencies. The delay in diagnosis in the treatment of NCDs uh, resulted is more advanced stages of disease as and unaffordable health outcomes. On this slide, I would like also to focus you in the main causes of disruption of the services. And as you can see on this picture, you can uh, understand that this is very important and it, I would like to particularly highlight the health, sense, uh, health system issues such such as this uh, 
shortages in the staff due to their divisions to the COVID patients, shortages of the PPE, uh, hospital beds, and essential medicines and diagnosis. But also the problem was with the transport, uh, transportation that was really limited with the patients and the medical facilities. And as you know, this could be often be hellas for the NCD patients and not re uh, receiving the timely treatment, increasing the rates of health attacks and strokes in many of these countries. So let me focus on the situation in the WHO uh, Afro region. So uh, what is the current situation in the Afro? Uh, the good news is that uh, the both NCDs and COVID rates are relatively lower than in the other WHO regions. But the bad news is that we are on this race. And for example, there, is a, there was a 31% increase in the reported cases of the COVID disease over the last week of the African uh, continent. Still, uh, the African regions accounts for less than 2.5% of the global COVID deaths. And it is an opportunity for us to take measures now uh, so the situation doesn't get worse. However, the bad news is that the vaccination rate is very, very low in the African region, and it is still less than 1% of all uh, the global reporting. So uh, how we should focus on the national capacity for the NCDs and pre prevention and control? In the following slides, I would like to brief uh, high like the focus of the global NCD platform, the department that I am leading in the WHO, what we are doing to control, how we can support the countries. And as we have this mandate uh, from the ECOSOC, from the member states to accelerate the actions across the sectors and stakeholders, we believe that it is very important to make sure that member states and particularly the ministers of health have the capacity to address not only the health system challenges to prevent and control NCDs, but also to reach out to other government sectors and non-state actors. And we are trying to involve all these uh, actors to be a part of this. This is academia, civil society, private sector, and we should work collaboratively with the WHO to achieve the sustainable development goals and to go on the NCDs and mental health agenda. And to achieve this, we advise countries to have a dedicated NCD units in their ministers of health to develop multi-sectoral action plans and, and incorporate them into the development plans, incorporate the whole of spectrum of NCD services from prevention to treatment, rehabilitation, palliative care, universal health coverage packages, and also to increase funding for NCDs through the domestic resources. To monitor how countries are progressing towards these goals, the NCD uh, department's technical teams conducts country capacity survey every other year. And these surveys usually have over 90% response rate and provide important insights into the member states' capacities from the government and policies, health systems, and program uh, perspectives. As we can see on this slide, 97% of countries in the region have the NCD unit on uh, NCDs in the Ministry of, of Health. And this is really a very good news. And it ind indicates that we are going very well on the commitments with the government to the achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 3.4. Uh, 
Uh, on this slide, I would like to show you the national capacity for NCDs uh, prevention and control. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that over 83% of the countries in the African region devote domestic funds for the NCDs. And this is a, a really very important to highlight. And uh, just sorry to, to yeah. interrupt, uh, you, you have about a minute and a half. Okay, sorry, I'm going quick. So uh, this is um, the slide that uh, I would like to show you. We can see that uh, countries in the region are going very uh, not to, uh, are not going very well in the terms of the governance structure for the cities. But this is such as a multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholders mechanism, it's very important to pay attention on this. So this is the slide which is showing the real, uh, the regional challenges. And the summary of uh, these regional challenges helps us to understand uh, where we are and what we are going to focus on. And the very most important is that I would like to pay your attention, the lack of financial, managerial and technical capacities. Uh, the data inconsistencies and weak of surveillance. We also need to focus on the need to strengthen Ministry of Health on their national forces to go on their NCDs. We need to work on the needs to estimate and strengthen national multi-stakeholder mechanism. And of course, it is very important in the context that I would like to highlight is to work in the communities, in work with the private sector, in work to involve the young researchers also, and of course, to uh, get more funds for the national capacities and to strengthen the, uh, the work in the countries. So it is a really great opportunity for me to join this meeting. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank, and thank over you. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Axel. I really appreciate it. And I would just say to the panelists, the, the way we've structured it is so that each panelist has 10 minutes. Dr. Axelrod has slightly more because I didn't use my entire five minutes. So please, uh, I try to keep your comments within the time so it gives us the opportunity to be able to have a conversation. At this point, um, I will uh, turn over to Dr. Leal Bajud and uh, Dr. Bajud, over to you. Thank you, Gede, and thanks to Beatrice and World Health Summit team for organizing this session and inviting me to speak and represent the Diffuse LCD partnership. Please allow me to share some slides that will help me to present my ideas. I hope you can see my screen. Okay, um, so as uh, Dr. Axelrod and Manasi had already highlighted, progress towards reducing premature death from non-communicable disease has been made across the globe, but not at the pace required to meet the sustainable development goals for 2030. Um, sorry, maybe I'm sharing this. I'm the wrong screen, sorry, just one second. How do I share this one? Uh, we see. There you go. Okay, very good. Um, but not at the pace required, as I said to me, the sustainable development goals for 2030. Developments made to NCT services are unequal across regions and income groups, thus exacerbating inequalities. Um, NCDs are known to cluster in poorer areas where there is unequal access to healthcare. Science exploring COVID-19 suggests that more severe cases are seen in people with pre-existing illness. It is therefore, as said earlier, uh, impossible to ignore the possibility that NCDs and COVID-19 are deeply linked. Um, therefore, the Defeat NCD Partnership and the Economist Intelligence Unit examined the intersection between NCDs and COVID-19 to draw lessons and um, opportunities from the emerging data. So uh, our study arrived at the following. 
there is a causal relationship between underlying NCDs and COVID-19, which means that when the society is healthy, even if the COVID-19 infection is right, is high, um, its case fatality remains low. Taking, taking Singapore here uh, as an example, which has among the lowest NCD mortality rates, it has 186 per 100,000 uh, population, which is lower than the global average by more than 50%. Singapore's COVID-19 case fatality rate, um, sorry, um, is less than 1%. Um, and as you can see from the chart, um, the higher the mortality due to NCDs, the curve of COVID-19 case fatality rate, meaning the red line on this chart, keeps going up. Um, our analysis revealed that factors strongly influencing this relationship include age, gender, smoking, and healthcare expenditure. Now, once these factors are accounted for, our modeling suggests that a 10% reduction in NCD mortality through better access to healthcare would have reduced COVID-19 fatality by 20% in low and middle income countries. Mm. Meaning if the society becomes healthier by having 10% less mortality due to NCDs, the COVID-19 case fatality rate declines by 20%. The average NCD mortality rate in all LMICs modeled was five per uh, thousand people. And the average COVID-19 case fatality was 24 per thousand people. This is the case in uh, Brazil, India, and Indonesia. So in a country of 60 million people, uh, if 6 million people were infected with COVID, they will have 144,000 related deaths. If we go further, and if we were to achieve SDG 3.4 of reducing by one third the premature mortalities due to non-communicable disease by 2030. So we reduce by one third. So the average five per thousand to become 3.7, we will find um, a reduction in COVID-19 fatality to 18 per thousand people, equivalent to 36,000 deaths death averted. And this is um, the example of the, the case in um, Paraguay and Pakistan. Further reducing the average NCD mortality by half would reduce COVID-19 fatality to 14 per thousand cases and avert 60,000 deaths. And this is what we have seen in Gambia and Rwanda as examples. So simply looking at this data, it has a huge implication on our programming to control COVID-19. So we actually need to reduce the underlying disease burden due to non-communicable disease to control COVID-19. Dr. Svetlana has highlighted the impact of the pandemic on healthcare service provision, especially on NCDs. And rightly said, COVID-19 has severely disrupted NCD services, leaving a backlog of patients who require care and support. The excess deaths due to COVID-19 service disruptions are currently unknown in, in most LMICs and need to be further understood. Despite this, it's likely that routine service disruption will have a long tail on NCD morbidity and mortality once the spread of COVID-19 has receded. The already under-resourced healthcare systems of in low-resource countries will struggle to grapple with this. This is why NCD care must be integrated into COVID-19 mitigation to help manage the backlog of patients unable to access care during lockdowns. With the above mentioned, the question is, is it possible to go back again on track and try to reach SDG 3.4 by 2030? And the answer, as Manasi highlighted in his opening, is it is possible. Because looking at the resources spent on COVID-19 response globally till date of $11 trillion, it exceeds the cumulative funding required to achieve SDG 3 by 2030. So with all the devastating impact of COVID-19, we could still turn the tide using COVID-19 as an opportunity for better NCD care. In summary, and as I mentioned before, the established causal relationship between underlying population NCDs and COVID-19 fatality, with the current NCD services being severely disrupted due to COVID-19, we could see from uh, our statistical analysis has showed that where a person lives and the relative wealth of the country was found to influence the relationship between underlying NCDs and death from COVID. Mm -hmm. This is why instead of funding diseases in isolation, 
health investments in low resource countries should take a systematic approach to prevent chronic disease uh, and communicable disease while meeting the challenge of universal health coverage. Our analysis showed as well that the coverage of healthcare system is an important determinant of whether NCDs in the underlying population increase the risk of death from COVID-19. It is suggested that increasing the number of community health workers will both improve coverage of care for households and generate return on investment, owing to a healthier population. Many countries also lack the regulatory framework required to integrate and reimburse telemedicine platforms within their health system. It is hoped that COVID-19 may be the force that encourage wider adoption. Telehealth services have been used as a backup for delivering NCD care during COVID-19 across uh, the NCD disease spectrum, including mental health, stroke, hypertension, and cancer. And finally, amid the dual challenge of COVID-19 and NCDs, there are opportunities to develop integrated care. The evidence has suggested that population vaccination also provide a convenient opportunity for NCD screening, which serves two purposes. On one hand, it provides a better understanding of population morbidity to help appro appropriately commission NCD services. On the other hand, it reveals acute health concerns in individuals. This is why COVID-19 vaccination centers today are therefore a prime opportunity for both screening and directing more people to appropriate care. So coming to the role of public-private people partnership, like the Defeat NCD partnership, what can we do? Um, and to keep the focus on Africa, I will give examples from our country programs in Rwanda and Gambia. So in Rwanda, we supported the Ministry of Health to integrate NCD screening and care into their COVID-19 national response plan, which resulted in mobilizing $4 million from the World Bank to fund NCD-related services. In addition, and um, despite the restrictions, lockdowns, and focus on COVID-19 response, with our support, the Ministry of Health approved for the first time in Rwanda a five-year national NCD strategy with a costed action plan for the prevention and control of NCDs. In addition, they approved the revival of a national multi-sectoral committee to oversee the implementation of the, plan, of the plan. So domestic funding, World Bank funding, and additional $1.6 million have been jointly mobilized so far in support of the plan. We have this year also embarked on the same journey in the Gambia, developing the first national NCD strategy and cost action plan and catalyzing efforts of all partners to scale up NCD care in the country. Engaging with frontline healthcare uh, providers like Maddie, whom we, we can see in the photo, is essential. Maddie lost loved ones to NCDs, and his passion to protect others from living the same experience motivates him to serve his community. He is a leading example, saving lives and showing the importance of community engagement, which I have highlighted uh, as a policy suggestion earlier. Last Thank but not least, the Defeat NCD partnership is working to expand the consistent availability and affordability of NCD supplies through the Defeat NCD partnership marketplace, which will allow uh, consistent availability of quality controlled medicines in Africa and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think what we've observed on the ground in terms of the deaths is what she's uh, demonstrated in the, the um, research uh, results that she's presented at this point. So again, just quick housekeeping. When, when there's two minutes left, I'll do this. So you know that you've got two minutes left and it gives you time to be able to. At this point, I'll call on, uh, turn over to uh, Dr. Uh, Shekta Pokar, Chief Medical Officer, Emerging Markets, uh, Beatrice. Over to you, Shekta. Thank you very much, uh, Judy, uh, for your moderation and really framing the conversation today. At the outset, I want to thank uh, the World Health Organization uh, for hosting the World Health Summit in Africa, bringing the spotlight on this continent, as well as the African healthcare system. And I also want to thank uh, my fellow panelists, uh, as well as the audience, uh, for your interest and attention to this very important topic uh, of uh, the impact of the pandemic on the NCD, something that uh, uh, I think we, we are all passionate about. So let me start by uh, framing what we already know. I think what we already know is that there is a reciprocal relationship between the COVID and the NCDs. Firstly, NCDs increase the vulnerability to COVID. I think we have seen the data. If you have an underlying NCD, you are likely to have 
uh, uh, increased chance of contracting severe uh, COVID if, mm -hmm. if, you, if they really contract COVID. And secondly, COVID increases the NCD risk factors. And we have seen an excellent survey, which uh, Dr. Svetlana talked about, the disruption of the uh, NCD services across 122 countries. And this uh, really illustrates how uh, uh, NCD risk factors are increasing during this pandemic. So what we are really witnessing is what we are calling as syndemic. This is a term which was first coined in 1990s to describe the HIV substance abuse and violence association. And this is now uh, gaining prominence again with, to describe COVID and NCD association. And this is on the same underlying social determinants of health, the inequities, the risk factors, the same things that we see uh, underlying both COVID and the NCDs. So uh, really, if you have to really understand uh, from uh, this endemic, uh, given the adverse outcomes which are associated with this endemic, we need to really dig deep, understand and learn from the lessons so that we can design safety nets for the future. If uh, for the future pandemics and for, the, uh, for ensuring NCDs are uh, appropriately prevented and controlled. So then what are the lessons that we can learn uh, from this endemic? Uh, I think some of the lessons uh, the previous panelists have already outlined. Let me uh, first start by saying that the COVID pandemic has shown that some of the tools which are in, uh, used in control of the pandemic are also the same tools which are also required for prevention and control of NCDs. Let me explain. So if you look at the countries, the communities and the societies which have fared somewhat better in pandemic response, what does what strikes out? I think there are three things which clearly uh, uh, they have in common. One, these countries or societies have better health systems, equitable access, universal health coverage, really highlighting the investments in the health systems. Second, we really see there is an involvement of public sector, private sector, and communities. So really talking about multi-stakeholder involvement. And third, we are talking about the public health tools like disease surveillance, screening, monitoring, tracking, Again, highlighting there is a focus on implementation. So to my mind, there are three lessons. There is an investment in health systems, involvement of multiple stakeholders, and implementation of what we know. Now let us take a quick look at NCDs. If you look at NCDs in Africa, what, what are the key gaps that emerge? I think the gaps, what we see here, based on the data which was presented earlier, there are gaps in the investments in health systems. There are gaps in implementing what we know versus what we practice. And there are gaps that we are not able to involve multiple stakeholders together. So again, there are similar themes that we saw are the lessons from COVID. Investments, implementation, and involvement are the three, three, three themes is what I would like to uh, offer as the core lessons uh, from this uh, pandemic. So what does it mean for planning the future? from solutioning perspective uh, for people living with NCDs in Africa. When we look at our experience over last several years in planning these non-communicable disease partnerships in low and middle income countries, we have come up, we have understood three key principles. And these three principles have been used by us in Viatris in planning our roadmap. One, no sta single stakeholder can do it alone. We cannot do it alone. We have to really collaborate with public sector, private sector, as well as with the civil society. If we have to come up with a proof of concept or a scalable solution, we have to really work together. That's principle number one. Principle number two is we need to be uh, approaching this uh, issue in an integrated or in a holistic way in, from a health systems perspective. In a syndemic world of COVID as well as NCDs, we need to approach it from NCDs and communicable diseases together. So it has to be integrated. view. That's lesson number two. And the third one is that we really need uh, essentially any solution for driving these collaborations need to be local. These have to be evidence-based and the evidence has to be anchored on the social determinants of health, which is very country specific. So that is the lesson number three. So in a nutshell, I think COVID has provided us with a new lens and this new lens is to view this crisis as an opportunity. 
if we have to convert this crisis into an opportunity, we can only do this if we can join hands, act together, and really implement on these three lessons which we have learned, investments, involvement, and really uh, working together as uh, uh, from an implementation planning perspective. So I'll pause here and hand it over back to uh, you, uh, uh, and, and it, it we'll be happy to discuss during the question and answer. Thank you. Hey, Shekta, thank you. That, that was amazing. <laughs> so again, just to, to, to from, from the beginning, Manasi told us about you know, the projections in terms of the numbers of NCDs and the need for us to be able to work together collaboratively. Dr. Asarov talked about disruptions to the health system and the need, and she talked about weaknesses in terms of investment, technical expertise, in terms of being able to build that. Dr. Bajud demonstrated how reduction in NCDs and investment in that can actually have better outcomes in terms of COVID patients. And now Shakta has pointed out how impossible it is for any one sector to be able to do this while we have to do this together. So this is, 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 is all coming together really well, which brings us obviously to Dr. Ratna Devi, who, who will, will, will speak next. Dr. Uh, Devi, uh, over to you. Thank you, Jude, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so I will now speak about the start of the show, which is a patient because all the discussions happen because there is a patient. If there were no patients and if there were no sick people, we wouldn't need all these changes or we wouldn't be talking about syndemics and pandemics. So considering that the NCD patient is unique in the sense that most NCD patients have a lifelong journey, it's not something that you treat once and you get rid of it. Uh, the second point that I want to highlight is that most NCD patients have very small part of their uh, life spent in a hospital in acute care if they are actually managing their condition well. Most of it is in their homes and communities. And very often health systems forget that the patient is actually managing the condition in the home and not in the hospital. Uh, the attention to the patient is drawn only when they report to the hospital with a complication. Uh, so a lot of uh, focus needs to go back to the patient to see how you can help the patient ma better manage their condition so that there are no future complications. And this br brings me to my favorite topic of a patient journey. So right from the awareness that something is wrong to the adherence, once you know a diagnosis is confirmed and there is a treatment pathway explained to the patient, there are several um, sort of ins and outs and complications and twists and turns. Very often, healthcare system looks at this whole patient journey as a linear path, which is not true. Uh, a, because most uh, patients have very unique responses to how uh, they manage their conditions depending upon their financial status, their sociocultural status, their availability and accessibility to healthcare systems. So when they enter and when they exit is decided by external factors, not by them. And the very fact that there are multimorbidities even complicates this further because you know if you have cancer and diabetes or cancer and hypertension, our healthcare system is so fragmented that you're probably seeing multiple specialities or even going to different hospitals. And the pandemic has further fragmented this. So whatever was available disappeared or went off the radar and people who were actually trying to manage their condition were pushed into homes with no access to medicines, no access to diagnostics, and then suffering serious mental health problems because they were fearing COVID-19 infection, they were fearing isolation. And if you look at vulnerable populations like the aged, the senior or the elderly populations who were staying alone with no family, or people you know, with mental health conditions, or people with dementia who are not able to take care of themselves, institutional care for many of these people almost stopped because the fear of the pandemic uh, pushed the healthcare workers to their villages or their homes. And therefore these people were left with institutions uh, in institutions with minimal staff, with no one to take care of them. So I would like to look at the pandemic from two perspectives. One is people with NCDs who were infected. And as we have been discussing you know, uh, over the last half an hour or so, 45 minutes, that uh, people with NCDs are adversely affected and they have a higher risk of mortality. But people who did not have NCDs and who had only risk factors or who had some, uh, you know, they were on the borderline, were actually pushed to frank NCDs because they were not able to manage their conditions well. 
So what can really help patients to overcome this? One is health literacy, and we know that health literacy is poor uh, because overall literacy is poor and then access to healthcare information is asymmetrical or sometimes whatever information is available is not authentic. And therefore people tend to believe uh, things that are not supposed to be done and do uh, you know, management of uh, their conditions in an unscientific or uh, uh, in an unwarranted way that leads to even further adverse events or exacerbation of their own conditions. So how do you get this information to people? How do you make them learn that uh, health is their own uh, responsibility? And if they have to manage their healthcare, they have to understand what the journey of that particular disease is and where can they intervene so that the outcomes are better. This is a big part, uh, especially from the perspective of patients in Africa that I think we need to focus on. The pandemic has also thrown the light uh, on telemedicine and digital tools. And because healthcare was already inaccessible and healthcare literacy is low, um, the divide between how patients can manage their healthcare with no physical contact with their healthcare provider became even bigger. So people, A, did not have Many, many places in Africa do not have the right bandwidth for them to be able to uh, access telemedicine or remote healthcare. Even if they did have the uh, bandwidth, uh, they did not have the ability to manage a smartphone or a, or a digital uh, you know, accessory that can allow them to book appointments or talk to their doctors. And this divided the gap further or increased the gap further and made them even more isolated from the services so that they felt really, really bad. So we conducted, uh, again, with support from Beatrice and uh, a few other partners, we conducted a survey last year. And the survey had two parts. One was to understand what barriers patients faced uh, due to the COVID-19. And the second was to complement uh, the first survey to understand what barriers healthcare providers faced. What stood out uh, between both the surveys was the fear of the pandemic. So the healthcare providers had two fears. One was of course, that if they went to the hospital, they might be infected and their loved ones would be at risk. The second uh, one was even bigger fear. They felt that they did not have the capacity to manage a COVID-19 patient if they landed in their clinic because they simply did not have the resources to manage. The patients on the other hand had similar fears. One was of course, going to a healthcare facility and getting infected. And the second, that if there are lockdowns or other severe measures, then they would lose their jobs or they would run out of food and water, or they would simply you know, uh, go into depression because they have no one to talk to or no one they can share their problems with. So both things added to the whole problem of uh, the pandemic and the NCD burden. Because while people were somehow managing their NCD condition, the addition of the mental health burden you know, aggravated the situation much more. So a lot of people reported depression, a lot of people reported stress, increase in stress, around 60% of respondents said that there was an increase in stress because of the severe, you know, lockdown conditions and other uh, measures that had been there. The third thing uh, that I felt as a person who is working globally with patient groups is that patient groups are not empowered enough. And this empowerment uh, or disempowerment comes from very reasons. One, as I said, um, Africa is a huge continent and there is no unified voice. So there, there needs to be a mechanism where all patient groups that are working in some of those countries are actually able to come to one platform as unified voice. Second is there is a severe lack of resources. So there is no institutional mechanism to support patient groups or patient-led initiatives. And I think the government, private sector, and other institutions have to understand that patients play a very integral role in strengthening health systems and that patients and patient groups need to be supported for that. So as you can see my banner, we have two initiatives in Africa as IAPO that is trying to bring this patient voice together. One is the Africa Patient Congress that's going to happen on 20th and 21st of July. And this is trying to get all patient groups under one platform to talk about varied uh, topics, including NCDs and COVID-19. 
The second is AMATA, which is the American Medicines Agency for uh, Treatment Alliance. And this is trying to get all patient groups together to bring regulatory harmonizations, access to quality medicines, and access to medicines as a whole. And both these initiatives is trying to reach out to the nook and corner of Africa to bring all patients under one umbrella, all patient groups under one umbrella, and bring other stakeholders to join them so that together they can build a stronger healthcare system. The third uh, important thing that um, I felt, and I alluded to, uh, uh, to this earlier, is um, there has to be, I mean, health is of course a topic that one needs to work on, but I, I always say that health is beyond health. So unless you are strengthening the environment that leads to good health, you cannot really achieve health. So getting digital literacy, access to uh, broadband and other services, access to even simple things like smartphones, how do you institutionalize and how can governments invest in that so that people are able to use those tools? Um, medical devices, you know, we are advancing so fast that we need medical devices uh, in every part of our life, especially for NCDs. How do you increase patient capacity to manage those medical devices that actually speak to your healthcare providers without your, uh, giving you an appointment? All that needs to be focused on. And most importantly, strengthen the patient groups. They are going to be the frontline warriors who, who will help you get your data, who will drive your research agenda, and who will get you credible you know, uh, patient voice that can tell you what is needed at the grassroots level. I'll stop there and wait for the questions. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. That's really, really important. And I think I want to go back to a point that um, Dr. Bajud made that even as we respond to the crisis at hand, there are things that we can do, incorporate in the response that actually helps strengthen health systems and NCDs. And so this is especially having the voice of patient groups because they are the recipients, they are the, 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 the recipients of the care is really important. Thank you very much, Dr. Ratna. Now, Dr. Feng Zhao at the, um, the World Bank, Dr. Feng, I, I'll turn over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for making me part of this important agenda and important event. Uh, as a person who has spent a decade on Africa, this is a really warm feeling come back to talk about Africa agenda. So thank you. Let me first maybe remind everybody, we're actually facing two challenges. COVID-19 has created two shocks. Um, the one is the health shocks, which we are familiar with the statistics, millions of lives has lost and the pandemic continues. So, um, you know, colleagues uh, on the panel has, has cited some important numbers. Um, and, and in the area of ICD, we know there's a significant impact. Uh, Svetlana and my fellow panelists has um, really highlighted that I don't want to repeat. Um, our survey also indicated more than 90% of the countries have at least one essential service disrupted, so which is consistent with WHO's data. So that's all there. But I just want to remind there's another shock, which is uh, economic shock uh, we are also experiencing. Um, um, you know, GDP growth has virtually stopped during the, the lockdown. Um, uh, people's livelihood has been affected. Uh, economic development and growth have become a really ch challenge. Um, um, we have about 163 million people sort of slipped back to poverty. And this is after 50 years continuous growth in our poverty um, alleviation effort. It has been a tremendous global achievement. And now we are when, uh, we're going backward. Um, we know during this economic shock, the revenue um, uh, has decreased. Uh, we have seen in many countries, the health spending actually increased, even, even surged. But I will argue those increased health spending, they're mostly targeting on emergency. They are not um, sustainable and they are not NCD centric. So we have to keep that in mind. I don't know how long they will last. Um, so in some country, maybe it will continue with the increased house uh, budget because, you know, colleagues realize 
um, a pandem pandemic like COVID uh, need to be addressed early and we need to uh, not waste this opportunity and invest early. That's good. But maybe in some country because of their physical space and they have to go back to balance their budget. So there's a big question mark in this regard. Um, so we have to really think about that those both shocks have tremendous impact on both supply and the demand of healthcare. Um, so this is the one thing we have to take in, into uh, account. Now, the collective question we need to ask is how do we recover from those shocks? Uh, how do we make our system more resilient? This has been a global uh, discussion, many recommendations has out of many distinguished panels and, and uh, groups. Now, for me, I think we will miss target if we only talk about a pandemic response. So if we only talk about make the system uh, stronger, which can detect the pandemic early, address outbreak in the early phase and prevent it from pandemic. This is critically important. Don't get me wrong, I support that. But if we miss other equally important part is how do we continue to provide essential services even during crisis? And then we miss the target. I think the both both fronts has to be getting equal attention. Um, we have seen during COVID, many innovation has emerged. Many countries has made tremendous effort to continue to provide services. Um, and Ratna has mentioned telemedicine and, and, and digital health and technology all helped. This is something we need to build on and think about how do we build a mechanism which is how we can continue to provide services. So on both fronts, I think this is critical. We need to keep that in mind. In terms of how do we come up with an investment framework moving forward, particularly get our colleagues from Ministry of Finance into part of this question. The World Bank, we are making an effort. We are thinking about an investment framework we can properly communicate with our colleagues at the country level who are making decisions on budget allocation on, resource, on resources. Um, throughout the pandemic, we see um, the hospital care, clinical care, like ICUs, emergencies, ventilators, oxygen concentrators, has captured pretty much the media attention because they are newsworthy, they're emergency. But I think if we think about investing only in those areas, again, we will miss target big time. So the way we want to approach this is we have to see systematically think about three layers of our defense system. The first layer is actually the upstream intervention. It's really our regular health system, right? Including NCD services, including all the essential services we're providing, in, in, including primary health care. How do we make them stronger, uh, more resilient, but also integrated into some of the public health functions and they can help on the, the both front I mentioned, both on detect, address uh, outbreaks early, but also continue to provide services uh, throughout the crisis. So that's the critical part. We need to continue to urge our finance ministry uh, colleagues and, and budget decision makers to continue to pay attention to that. The second part, which has been weakened for decades is the key public health function. Because you know, working in hospital in many countries earn more income, you know, got a lot of attention, and public health function in peacetime, in normal time, it, it's hard to argue its, its value, right? So now with COVID, I think we, we keep saying we don't waste a, um, a crisis. And this is the perfect time for us to think more. How do we create that key public health functions? Many countries have benefited from their capacity. Um, some country's testing program has really helped the country dodge a big bullet. Uh, many countries contact tracing has been strong that really helped them to avoid into this, um, the hospital crisis. So we should really learn up, uh, about this and surveillance system um, and lab system need to be in place. Uh, that's also critical. Lastly, is really our, our clinical care. It's about save lives. When, a pandemic did occur, and we have to have that capacity. Uh, but they are not the whole thing. They are part of integrated our defense system. Which, when we come up, when we think about the investment, we, we need to think about um, holistic. Let me wrap by saying NCD is a big part of this agenda. Um, I fully agree. We need to invest uh, wisely 
and invest strategically. The innovation has emerged through COVID um, need to be really prioritized. Uh, as the NCT community, we need to systematically think about how we not only argue the resources lacking, but also think about how do we smartly invest in the key priority areas. And there's many best buys in the NCD areas, but we need to properly communicate that. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Feng, and uh, really, really incredible. I'm, I'm really glad that you brought out the second exogenous shock to the system, which is the economic one, because Dr. Svetlana, as Svetlana in her uh, presentation noted underinvestment. Well, without GDP growth, without revenue, it becomes even harder for countries to be able to invest in that. So I'm glad that you brought that up. But as we now pivot to our Q&A, Dr. Axelrod had a couple of slides in terms of the challenges and the solutions. And it would be really, really good if Dr. Axelrod could just go over those slides and then we'll pivot to the, to the question and answer. So Dr. Svetlana. Okay, it, uh, uh, well, whenever she comes back, we will, uh, when, when we will we'll go to, we'll go to her. Uh, so first, uh, let me see if we got any, we didn't. So um, then I'll go to Dr. Bajud because you, you've done and you presented some of that in terms of the, the study of the impact of, of COVID-19 um, in partnership with the EIU, and you, you published some of that study. Could you just talk to us a bit about the primary work streams during pandemics and the, the major findings in, a, in addition to what you've already told us? Thank you so much, Kede. And if I uh, may mention that uh, my colleague, Chrissy uh, Bishop, who's now attending all the, the session, I'm not sure if we can also bring her up, uh, her up uh, into this discussion. Um, she could also help in, um, because she was one of the main researchers also on the, on the study. Um, what I could highlight is, I think what I try to mainly highlight in, in my speech is that we could actually now make use of the, the current resources. Today for COVID-19 response, um, funding has been made available for healthcare services. And we really need to um, model the, the response um, to work on a health system approach to strengthen um, the health system rather than doing patchy um, programming, single disease approach. Um, um, I mean, um, for Rwanda, for example, what during our cost of action plan development, um, even with a very um, high level percentage of health uh, insurance available for population in Rwanda, we found that around only 4% of the population who are expected to have diabetes are actually diagnosed and enrolled into care. Mm. Um, so this puts a lot of these people into extreme risk because they don't even know that they have to be extra careful. Um, and that's why we have been encouraging also for increased screening even during this time. And just, just, just quickly, one of the things that Manasi spoke about was this public-private part, partnership and toward the end of your, your presentation, you, you, you spoke about that a little bit. Could, could, you, could you expound on that in terms of the, the kind of partnership that allows us to get this health outcomes? Uh, sure, so just a quick introduction to the Defeat NCD partnership and our four pillars of work. Um, so it, we are a public-private people partnership. We are anchored into the United Nations system. We are housed at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, uh, but we still work with governments, with private sector, with philanthropies, academia, and the community itself. So our work is um, around four pillars of work. The first one is national capacity building. And in that we work with the uh, government, with all stakeholders into countries um, to have the systems, the structures in place um, to respond and tackle NCDs. So we, our team is located with the Ministry of Health NCD divisions. We share, co-located with them. And the main entry point into the country is a strategic national costed action plan where we join partners together to 
define this specific set of activities that could be achieved during that period. The second pillar of our work is community scale up. So we look at innovation, we look at startups, entrepreneurs, or community services that could really help patients do more patient self-care and reduce the, mind, the last mine delivery, increase, sorry, the last mine delivery of, of uh, supplies. Uh, so trying to reach the people who need the services at the nearest and most efficient way. The third pillar is the Defeat NCD Marketplace, which is um, a marketplace of NCD medicines, diagnostics, medical equipment, and supplies that will provide um, quality assured, affordable um, NCD medicines and supplies in a pooled procurement manner. Today, the main challenge that countries in Africa and uh, other small countries in the Caribbean region, for example, face is that they buy small quantities and in separation. So bringing all of this power together, and that is a model that has made a difference in HIV treatment, in, in malaria treatment, um, in TB treatment. So if we are able to bring the same uh, pooled procurement power, which also uh, the WHA resolution um, was talking about, we could really make a difference in the quality of supplies available and the affordability of these supplies, including for generics. Um, and the last pillar of our work is about innovative NCD financing. So we not only develop nice, fancy documents of cost action plans and strategy that everyone after one month forget about, but we jointly with the government raise funds domestically and internationally, in, in addition to investments that are a sustainable investment, not only a small grant that will end up soon. So we raise funds toward these costed action plans to make sure that whatever program starts does not end after three years leaving people behind. Thank you, thank you. My understanding was that even the, in, in buying COVID um, vaccines, the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Tax Team, one of the problems they first encountered was they had to demonstrate scale that they were gonna be able to buy this in, in, in quantity. And so they had to pool their resources. So I think that's really, really important. Thank you. Don't know if Dr. Axelrod has joined us, uh, um, but uh, we will go to uh, Shakta. My understanding is Viatris is in the process of, of that you've done um, some research and it's a publication that, that's gonna be released. Could you tell us and give us some extracts about this publication in terms of what you found? We have been uh, collaborating with, of course, the, the Defeat Entity uh, group, as uh, Dr. Layal has uh, talked about. Okay. And this is uh, the collaboration uh, with Economic Intelligence Unit and the Defeat Entity group to really plot the in, uh, interdependence of the COVID and the NCDs and what is the impact of the pandemic on the NCDs? What type of uh, investment case that is available? What kind of uh, possibilities exist for us to uh, plan some of the proof of concepts based on the understanding of this uh, interaction between the pandemic and the NCDs? So this is one uh, exciting uh, uh, piece of research which uh, the Defeat NCD and the Economic Intelligence Unit has done. I think uh, Dr. Layal has already called out very key take-homes from that in terms of the investments which have already happened in uh, the pandemic, uh, which are probably um, uh, $11 trillion, which while the, co uh, while the NCD investment which is required for achieving sustainable development goal is just about $370 billion. So it's by order of magnitude, which is very much possible for us to address if we are able to really uh, take a holistic integrated view and really approach as Dr. Lyle mentioned uh, to uh, look at proof of concepts or pilots whether, whether in vaccinations or whether in uh, some of the COVID screenings, if we are able to integrate NCD care and uh, control. So that, that is one exciting uh, uh, research that we conducted recently. Thank you. I was muted. I, that's, that's like every, everything now. But Chrissy Bishop, who worked with Dr. Lea, um, Dr. Yeah, she, because she's not a panelist, also she can't speak, but she said that um, it, as well as the strong causal relationship between NCDs and COVID-19 that they found in their modeling, they also noticed severe disruptions to routine NCD care 
left a backlog of patients who require care and support. I think that's a very important piece. Uh, and too bad that Chrissy couldn't speak. Uh, so if, if she keeps typing now, I'll read what she says. Um, Sorry, good, uh, good. just to clarify, Chrissy works for the Economist Intelligence Unit. So she's- EIU, like, right? Yeah. yeah exactly. Okay. And th there is some hands raised if in the attendees. I don't know how you could pick up that. Uh, I, I, I don't see, uh, do, do you see any hands raised? I, I don't see any hands raised. Yeah, there is uh, Ave or Jock. Oh, that's, all right, well, I'm, I'm the moderator and I can't see his hand, it's kind of weird. Um, let me see. We will get to him quickly. I just wanted to go to this one, um, one, I mean, I see, I just, you know, I just wanted to come back to you just quickly and, and then we'll, we'll go to go to them. You, at the beginning, in, in, when, when you spoke, you sort of brought together all of the threads of almost everything that everyone has said. And, and for us, I guess looking forward now, what are the key things that Beatrice is gonna be doing in, in partnership with African governments so that this can be addressed, right? I mean, you're the private sector, there are things you have to do to, to, to for shareholders, but, but also to be able to address people in this market, people, sick people in terms of health systems. What, what, what are some of the things that you're gonna do that bring all of these threads together? I, I unmuted a couple of times uh, uh, and, and thought myself, but actually when Dr. Lael was talking about uh, the, the ability to be able to bring it all together, I think she articulated it without repeating all those things, uh, Judy. Look, I, I'll take us back uh, to uh, prime examples uh, uh, we have. Uh, during the uh, kind of epicenter of uh, the HIV crisis, uh, you know, treatments not uh, available, our ability to be able to innovate from a, a product uh, perspective, actually make the treatments that are uh, thousands of dollars on a per month basis in uh, developed markets available for less than $100 uh, per patient on an annual basis. Um, along with the, the funding mechanisms, uh, so the creative financing uh, components uh, that uh, Dr. Leal talked about, but also being able to go that last mile and providing the access. But we're a pharmaceutical company, and uh, for sure, uh, our, our piece is around a funnel that we talk about from a patient, and somebody talked about this, understanding what disease that they have. So the awareness to be able to, in a simplified manner, to just, I, I have something wrong with me. I need to be able to go and find someone that's going to appropriately diagnose it all the way to what sort of treatments are available if medicine is part of it, uh, other treatments also may be uh, part of it. But in that funnel, uh, we, we've been able to demonstrate uh, tremendous, tremendous success as we bring multiple stakeholders together. Uh, th this is my point, and, and this is the point that uh, I think all the panelists have, have made time and time again. Uh, this is not a solution the private industry or the government or NGOs can, can create. But if I make a long story short in this HIV space, from a Beatrice perspective, more than half of the patients are on a Beatrice medication today in, in the space of HIV. As I told you, from thousands of dollars per month to less than $100 on a per annum basis with equivalent treatment uh, medicines. That, that are available to you and I in the United States or, or anywhere else around the world. So to, to me, it's that call to action to be able to create that sustainable model as opposed to one-offs that uh, tend to die, um, you know, a, a few weeks after uh, the, the focus and the attention has gone away. But Dr. Feng made a tremendous, tremendous points. This lingering health and economic effect needs to be dealt with uh, because there is no economic prosperity without health uh, prosperity. And, and vice versa. Thank you. And uh, I saw that Al Eve Ojuk, her, her hand was up. I, I don't know if there's a means for you to speak. So could you please type your question in the Q and A box so that I'll be able to reach to it, um, get to it. Uh, Doctor, right now I want to come back to you because one of the things that you talked about was the importance of understanding the prevalence of underlying conditions and patients that allows the government to be able to respond. And uh, <clears throat> what are some of, some of the easier, not easy, but attainable actions that governments could take in, in pursuit of that? That's right. Um, okay, there are several solutions, but um, you know, um, I'll talk about what is the low hanging fruits. Uh, okay. As I said, you know, uh, understanding the patient um, as an important stakeholder. Right now, most patients are not considered stakeholders, or even if they are, 
uh, it's not the dignified listening that's happening. It's the tick in the box saying, okay, there is patient participation. But if governments, private sector, academia, et cetera, started considering patients as an important stakeholder, gave them the dignity uh, to the voice that they bring and listen to them patiently in whatever way they are conveying their message. Because right now, patients in Africa are, are at a very nascent stage, uh, except for certain disease areas where there are expert patients. So until we reach a stage where the patients becomes, become experts, are able to talk the language, uh, of say the regulators or the healthcare professionals or policy makers, one has to be uh, you know, patient and listen to them, give them the ability to voice their concerns and uh, give them what matters to them and use that or convert that into a scientifically applicable um, you know, format so that it informs the policy making or um, the treatment mechanisms or uh, even the algorithms that need to be followed to manage the conditions. I think mm -hmm. that's one low hanging fruit that uh, can be easily done. All they need to do is recognize that patients bring value and not just system uh, part of the system as a commodity who are just paying for a service. So when they consider health is a value and is adding, because if healthy patients are there, healthy people are there and they're not patients, they add value to the government, to the countries, bring in revenue and are more productive. So if that mindset can happen in um, the minds of the policymakers and other stakeholders, uh, there could be a big change that can be brought there. The other part of it is, and if this is moving forward from just listening to them, uh, not much research happens in the context of Africa, and therefore much of what comes as scientific knowledge is from the other part of the world. So once patients are empowered enough to be able to drive their own research, bring in data to the table so that they're able to speak uh, for their own uh, you know, uh, causes or for their own therapy areas, I think that will change the healthcare system to uh, work uh, with what patients from Africa need not bring something from some other place which is successful and give it to the patients to Africa. I think you will get better health outcomes then. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Feng, I wanted to come back to you because you know, you, what, you try, you, what you did was wrap this up, not just in terms of the health crisis, but also the economic crisis. And you said that there are you know, three areas. I think you said the, the upstream and health policy so I, I, what I, I know the bank has been, it's heavily invested in this area. So if we were going to make investment in terms of the three areas that you, you where, where do we make the investment to get the, the greatest benefits like up, up front? Where, 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 where should government, how would you advise governments who are, you know, who are listening today, who are on this, on this, on this, this panel, listening in terms of thinking how to deploy resources? Thank you. I mean, if you compare COVID with the previous um, epidemics, outbreaks. Uh, one thing we have learned is uh, the international community and countries um, took much quicker action to react this time around. Um, so financing has been quickly mobilized both at the international level and country level. Um, so this is one thing we need to, we need to look into it. Um, so I don't want to draw the con uh, conclusion financing is not a problem, but it's a lesser problem than before. Uh, now we really need to think about a way of how do we use money wisely. Um, if you think about in the early phase of the COVID, even you have money, you couldn't get the essential supplies, right? The market is broken. At this time, particularly in Africa, even we have money, we couldn't, we couldn't access to vaccines. Um, again, so money is all, not all the answer, but, but really uh, strategic investment, as I mentioned earlier, not only to cope with the emergency we're having now, but think about long, long term will be critical uh, for us collectively. Um, at the World Bank, you know, we have put in two phases of emergency risk. You know, not the first phase is emergency, the second phase is COVID. So which $6 billion, um, which is unprecedented speed. Within three months, we already reached more than 100 countries. That's never happened in the World Bank history because normally you take time to design a pro project and make sure it's have all the nine yards covered. But for emergency, we have on average one week project is improved, really streamlined. And for the vaccine phase, we put in $12 billion. 
And, and in addition to this so-called health response, we'll, ha we'll have a much larger package for, for socioeconomic response, uh, touch, tag, on, um, and tag on economic growth, and also social safety net or other programs. Uh, that over $100 billion. So that's, that's already some investment, some platform can be used. But I think the critical thing is the country level investment, um, use country budget. International money can only go so far and the domestic financing is, is the big part of it. Um, so my, my guess to answer your question is along the three areas, we need to think about strategic investing and also to really uh, have a framework uh, on domestic investment um, and the international financing can complement. Thank you. Thank you. We, we at the, for, for participants, as I noted, if, if you just typed your question in the chat box, we will be able to read your question. But it's, it's, it, it seems to me that certain themes came up again and again. Um, one of them is that this is, it, it's, the response is going to have to be collaborative. The private sector has a role. The, the nonprofit sector has a role, as does the government have a role. Researchers have a role. The, the, the second thing is that we have to find innovative ways of being able to do that because budgets are under stress, right? Uh, um, there, there are people who even in normal times were cut off from health services. It's become even worse with the disruptions that have happened with health services for us to be able to do that. But uh, as Dr. Ratna kept saying again and again, that we have to see patients as more than simply customers who come and pay for a service and leave. That in terms of the quality of the service that's provided, they need to be able to recognize their voices. She said we should be patient with patients. <laughs> and and, and um, um, but Dr. Leah laid out that whatever investments we make in health and strengthening health systems for NCDs actually benefits us in times of pandemics because it actually reduces mobility. It, it actually reduces the fatalities we see in terms of the outbreak because we've made those investments. And she gave examples of how this partnership works. So and and and, and Dr. Axelrod actually spoke about the role that the WHO plays, the challenges that the WHO faces. And then uh, Shekta also talked to us about the importance of being able to, to work together collaboratively and how to use this information. Dr. Feng, of course, listed off, uh, laid out for us that this isn't simply a health crisis, that a health crisis has precipitated an, an, an economic crisis that is now having an impact on our health outcomes. And I mean, I see just sort of sort of brought all of this together in terms of how we work together to do this. So on behalf of WHS, on behalf of Beatrice and, and the organizers, I just want to thank everybody. First, the panelists for, for, for um, you know, enlightening us with your expertise and, 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 and uh, really, really appreciate it. But also WHS for, for organizing this, Beatrice for supporting this and all of the the participants on behalf of the, the, the organizers, I want to thank everyone and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit and, and, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Gudi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.